you probably know this already, but this coast and ocean out here from Moran County all the way down to Cambria is our nation's second largest marine sanctuary. And sanctuaries are fantastic places, not only for the resources that are protected, but also for the myriad of ways in which communities and individuals connect with them. And our guest speaker tonight uh, has a unique way of connecting with the marine sanctuary. Uh, he's a scuba diver. Dr. Lonhart uh, works for the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary, and he is an expert in uh, marine invertebrate zoology as well as kelp ecology. Uh, but he's an expert in scuba diving as well. Um, he's got a real passion for little cool small critters in the, <laughs> in the marine environment. I'll tell a funny story. We were um, out on our research vessel one time and a humpback whale approached us, surfaced right next to the boat. Everyone ran over to see the whale, snapping pictures with their, with their cameras. And Steve hollers out, look at those barnacles. <laughs> he could care less about the whale. It was all about the barnacles. They were really big. It was impressive. <laughs> Dr. Larnard's a senior scientist on our staff and it's just a, a great um, asset to this community with his scientific knowledge um, and his diving expertise. And so without further ado, Dr. Steve Larnard. Really my goal here is twofold. Um, first, if you're not going to ever become a diver, I hope to expose you to some of the cool things that divers see underwater. And for those of you who aren't divers but might be interested in becoming divers, Hopefully this will serve as an inspiration for you to actually go for it and become a scuba diver. So I wanted to start with a quote from Charles Darwin, who when he was relatively young and before he had written The Origin of Species, um, was on the voyage of the Beagle. And he said, uh, after making observation of kelp forests off the tip of Tierra del Fuego in southern South America, he said, the numbers of living creatures of all orders whose existence intimately depends on kelp is wonderful. I can only compare these great aquatic forests with the terrestrial ones in intertropical regions. Yet if any country a forest was destroyed, I do not believe nearly so many species of animals would perish as would here from the destruction of the kelp. Now, the reason I think this is so impressive is because Darwin, who at the time was actually the, the sort of uh, companion of the captain on, on the voyage and was sort of doing science, so to speak, on the side, was literally relying on dragging a net over the side of the ship, letting it scoop stuff up, bringing it up to the surface, and then making his observations based on those scoops. I mean, think if you were in a helicopter flying at night and you went over Yellowstone and you said, hey, let's drop a net over, see what we scoop up, and that's how we're gonna describe all the cool things that are in Yellowstone. That's what these guys were doing back in, in about 18, in the 1830s. So it's really impressive that even at that stage, someone who was not scuba diving, who was not seeing the organisms in place, understood how rich and diverse the area is. So I didn't make it to the tip of South America. I got as far as Santa Catalina on my voyage. <laughs> um, this is what the lab used to look like back um, in the late 80s, uh, when I was there as an undergraduate, I went out as a, as a biology student through UCLA's Catalina Marine Biology Quarter and spent 10 weeks out there. And that's the, the fateful quarter as a senior where I went from wanting to be a doctor of medicine to becoming a doctor of marine biology, much to my parents' chagrin. Um, but it's something that once you get immersed in the system, it's, it's fascinating. It truly is a completely different world. Um, I started with my face down in looking at small things, as Paul had mentioned, um, in kelp forests, studying the organisms that were there. I actually had one of my exams underwater with uh, my professor. It was kind of challenging, but it was fun. Um, I then used a project that I had done as an undergraduate to um, pursue a master's at Cal State Long Beach, where I studied this snail, um, Norisia norisei, and its vertical migration up and down kelp. And I had so much fun doing that, I said, well, let's study another snail for my uh, PhD, also with a name that's repeating itself, in this case, Caledia Caledia after Admiral Kellett. And um, my love of snails and invertebrates and kelp forests was cemented at that point. And once I graduated, I was fortunate enough to get a job working for the sanctuary and start to do expeditions up and down the coast from Cambria um, up to uh, Half Moon Bay. So 
When we think of kelp forests, oftentimes folks picture something like this. This is a particularly abundant year for kelp um, off the coast, off the Cannery Row. Um, Point Lobos, you might recognize that area in Whaler's Cove, see the little track where the, the boats go through, <clears throat> keep the kelp canopy clear. And even further south down in Big Sur, like at uh, Square Black Rock near Big Creek, the marine reserve there, there's nice, lush, healthy kelp beds that you see throughout the sanctuary. If you're sailing or if you're in a kayak, you might have an even more personal experience with the kelp and actually be able to touch it. And this is what it looks like up close. Some of you may like it and some of you may not. Sometimes people don't like it when it washes up on the shore and starts to degrade and starts to smell, but it's feeding an entire community of organisms that are subsidized by that productivity from the near shore going into the intertidal and into the terrestrial system. It can look like spaghetti sometimes. It's sometimes, depending on the species, that long whip that one kid will chase another kid with, thinking they're Indiana Jones, and cracking it. <clears throat> and if you're a kid and you live in this area, your view of what a kelp forest is is almost certainly this one. This is a shot standing outside the kelp forest tank at the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And for many children, that's their first exposure to seeing what's underwater that's almost live and touch. It's, it's, it's a step better than TV, but it still doesn't really give you the full immersive experience. Here's in the corner shot when you're looking at uh, bull kelp and the waves crashing. And for me, it is probably as close as you're going to get besides actually jumping into the water yourself. So there's a it's really cool opportunity to get exposed that way. Um, I want to spend just a few minutes talking about the kelp before I actually, the kelp canopy before I actually dive in underneath it. The kelp itself is an interesting feature because it's a habitat. And here you can see on these blades, um, some of them are a sandy color, and that's because there's an organism, an animal that's a, a forming a crust growing on them. So the kelp itself, it's making its own living doing photosynthesis, but it's also providing habitat for other organisms to live on. And some of these species, like the bull kelp, will only be there for a year. They're annuals. The giant kelp is a perennial and can last from one to three years, depending on water temperature and, and surge and, and wave activity. But these guys, the, the bull kelp, Nereocystis, starts essentially microscopic and grows up to 20, 25 meters long, all in the span of several months. The blades get up to the, the surface there where they can uh, photosynthesize and also get the spores up there to re be released and dispersed, and then they're gone. Or they just end up showing up on your beach and your, your son or your grandchild starts whipping it around trying to beat other people with it. Other organisms use it like our friend the sea otter. So this is off the coast of Cannery Row there. They can wrap themselves in the kelp. It serves as sort of a, a little anchor for them, so to speak, when they're trying to keep the parts of their body dry and, and conserve energy. Sometimes they just are sitting on top of it. This guy sort of is like, hey, what's going on? And you can see that even though there are mammals there, sometimes there are other mammals that are in the kelp. And so um, sometimes you see things that you don't expect. When you're a diver, usually you think, if I'm in the forest, the bears can't get me. <laughs> and the bears being white sharks and other things. Um, but we know that they do come into the kelp forest occasionally. Um, things like dolphins do. I was even diving once off of Pacific Grove and I saw a very large object swim by me, much larger than a sea lion. And I was like, what is that? And I looked over and it just kept kind of passing and passing. And it took me a second to realize a gray whale had just done a, a swim by on me. And the two divers who were in front of me had been looking in the opposite direction. My immediate thought was, oh no, they didn't see it. No one's going to believe me <laughs> that I just saw a whale underwater. And I, ran, I swam over to them, kind of grabbed them like, did you see? And they're like, what are you talking about? And I wrote whale on my slate. And they were like, yeah, right. Well, the cool thing was that whale was as curious about us as we were about them. And it came by two more times with its eye looking right at us. And it was only about 25, 30 feet long, so it was relatively young. But to me, it, was, it, it is and still is the largest thing I've seen underwater. And I didn't realize how graceful they are underwater. So we do have visitors that we don't normally think of coming to kelp forests. 
And then the kelp forest itself, that canopy, serves as a habitat for other organisms. It can be so thick and dense that a bird can walk on it and not sink through it. So here you've got a blue heron that's, uh, I don't know if you can see, but there's a little gold, golden fish, a uh, kelp perch that it just had snagged out from underneath the little canopy. So you think if you're under the canopy, you're safe, but you're not. <laughs> and here it's now, you can see that fish kind of sticking out there and it's gonna get down head first into the gullet and it's gone. And so when you see egrets or herons or other birds walking around looking very carefully at the kelp canopy, they're actually foraging. Um, so sometimes you'll see birds just sitting on there and just using it as a, a place to roost and relax. But birds have an, a, oftentimes an intimate interaction with the kelp as a foraging ground. Divers also can have an intimate relationship with the kelp canopy. Um, here we've got a diver who is not necessarily all that excited about starting the dive. We did blow some of the, the kelp out of the way. The RV Fulmar is in the background there. That's Plaskett Rock. This is down off the coast of Big Sur near Jade Cove. Divers are much more excited when they're done with the dive and they've surfaced, even though we might be in the thick of the kelp. And then they're really happy when they're back on the inflatable and headed back to lunch, which is on that bigger boat, the Fulmar there in the background. And that's when they're really happiest, when the dive is over. They can warm themselves back up, get something to eat. And here we've got just a really flat, calm day in Big Sur. Um, one of the cool things of my job is that I've been able to work off of this platform to do scientific research off the coast of Big Sur, which hadn't been possible mainly for logistical reasons. Um, if you go down to Big Sur, it's a long enough steam that you need to have a boat that you're gonna sleep on. And much to my wife's chagrin, one, one summer I was on that boat for about 25 days and nights, not in a row, but over the course of the summer. But it was an amazing opportunity. We, we literally got to see and dive places that maybe only a handful of people have ever visited, ever. Um, just because it's not really easy to get down there, it's not really easy to explore. But with a platform like this, which you can see out at the breakwater here docked right next to the U.S. Coast Guard vessel, um, it is possible. So the boat, the Fulmar, has taken us to really cool places. So when you look at this sort of typical shot of Bixby Bridge and the Big Sur coastline from Hurricane Point, probably almost all of you have been there and stopped on that windy promontory and looked out at the Pacific Ocean. Um, almost all along that coast, everywhere you can see with about a five to 1,000, 500 to 1,000 meter spacing, I've been diving along that coast as part of different projects. And it's really variable. There are places that we've been to literally right underneath Hurricane Point where our expectations were extremely low because of what we saw from the surface canopy coverage from uh, satellite and aerial photography, from what we thought the geology was gonna be like, and then you go diving and you're completely wrong. And that's something that's always um, exciting about this job is thinking we know it all and being, being proven wrong, which makes us want to go out and learn even more. Some of the places in Big Sur, like I said, are, are not diving destinations because day trips can't get down there and back. It's not economically feasible. Um, usually you have to be on a liveaboard. So there's some crazy rocky promontories. Um, the boat, we, where that rock is, it's about 60 feet deep. And where the boat was, was about 120 feet deep. And that's only of about, I don't know, 40 meters distant. So extremely steep. You can imagine that rock cliff just extending straight on down. And some really dramatic places to go diving. The first step's a doozy. Um, when you're going off of a six foot high platform off the water, uh, that giant stride, as they call it, can be um, exciting. Um, it's, it's always a rush when you get underwater, you swim over to the kelp and then you get underneath the kelp. And that's when you start thinking about those analogies that they always make of a kelp forest is really similar to like being in, in say, a coniferous forest or a redwood forest where you've got this cathedral-like structure with sunlight streaming through. And that's really what does happen. And it's great. Um, sometimes you'll see some of those little fishes that are underneath the canopy that those herons and egrets are going after. Um, if it's the right time of year. 
as you start to descend down the kelp, it gets a little darker. It's not quite as sunny. Light attenuates as it's going down. Um, and you see some really cool things when the visibility is good. And down Big Sur, oftentimes, we're in really clear water. And we descend 10, 15, 20, 25 meters deep. We're not going really that deep. It's not technical diving. but you get a sense of awe as you go down, realizing there's a lot of water between me and the air above. In a forest, you might see, in a, in a terrestrial forest, you might see birds flittering around, um, squirrels running back and forth. We've got rockfishes usually, and perch that are serving that role, flitting around uh, in the midwater area. Here's a lot of blue rockfish that are cruising about. Here's a shot of the canopy and the sunlight coming through. And then this really dark stuff on the bottom is the sub canopy. So just like in a tropical rainforest where you have very tall trees that get the lion's share of the light, there are other species of trees that live underneath those that are shade adapted. And <clears throat> these uh, stipitate kelp sort of are the same way. They can grow in low light levels and underneath the kelp, uh, the giant kelp canopy. And then you might not be able to quite see, but there's a lot of little dark shapes up above that understory kelp. That's lots of little rockfishes. And here's more of them. We had one year, two years ago, where the young of the year rockfishes were literally like flies and mosquitoes buzzing around in a terrestrial forest. We had so many of these things, it was actually difficult at some point to take macro shots, so up close shots, because they were getting in your way. Um, that's part of the productivity of where we live. Sometimes we have incredible um, boom cycles for fishes, for kelp, for other organisms. Um, and this was one of those years. Here's another shot showing again sort of the, the, the kelp as trees, so to speak, and then literally thousands upon thousands of mostly rock fishes um, that had just come in uh, a few months beforehand. They'd been out in the ocean um, as sort of transparent larvae and then head into shore, carried in by currents, um, get some pigment, start off in the canopy and then run the gauntlet going down to the bottom hoping mom and dad don't eat them on the way back because the parents don't know whose kids who. <laughs> the kelp is anchored to rock. That's one thing that's a truth is that if you see kelp, you know there is some hard substrate there. The converse is not true. And we found that out sort of the hard way. Um, usually you look at a map that's got aerial coverage of the kelp. And if you go, oh, well, there's no kelp there. And there's never any kelp there. There must be sand on the bottom. Because if there's rock, there's got to be kelp. Well, it doesn't mean you're going to get kelp going all the way up to the surface. We've been to areas where we said, oh, this is going to be one of those all sand dives. Uh, but we have to do it because it's part of this particular project. And we'd get down, and it's all boulders and understory kelp. It's just the water's turbid enough, or the environment's not quite right for consistent recruitment of kelp, of canopy forming kelp, but you do have understory kelp. And then places like in Carmel Bay near Stillwater Cove, you can really see how the geology shapes the kelp forest. So in between ledges of sedimentary rock, that are relatively flat and lots of kelp growing up off of them, you've got sand channels that are devoid of kelp that's growing but may be packed full of drift kelp that a, a variety of organisms are utilizing as part of the detrital food web. Here's just a little bit to show you the scale of diver. Definitely not me, way too skinny, but uh, <laughs> uh, this is one of those really nice clear days in Carmel. And as you look at the rock, what you realize, it's not just the anchor for the kelp. It's actually home to a lot of organisms. And there's actually very rarely do you see true bare rock on actual reef. You might see bare rock on small rocks that are tumbling around. But on uh, contiguous reef beds, there's virtually no open space unless the rock has recently been damaged. And here's another shot that shows you urchins, hydrocorals, anemones, sponges, strawberry anemones, um, annelid worms. Every square inch, and even more than what's on the rock, the organisms will start growing on each other. And so as we get down to those rocks, that's where 
Uh, we switch from all of these, almost all of those photos I've been showing you or taken by my colleague here, Chad King up front with the wide angle camera. And we're now gonna switch from the wide angle sort of gestalt view of the kelp forest and drill down in uh, to the things that are growing on the rocks or living around them. And we're gonna start off with the giant kelp itself. This is the iconic species that makes up most of the kelp forest here. And you can see sort of the production line from the bottom, the youngest part of the kelp, going older and older as you go back, the formation of what starts out as a little bump and then becomes an actually more and more well-defined air bladder that's filled with gas that's very similar to the composition of atmospheric air that we breathe. And then you can see how the blades start to form and elongate at this apical uh, scimitar. And here's another shot of it that kind of shows you the real quick development in this case of the air bladders, pneumatocysts that are, like I said, filled with air and the production of the blades. One of the fastest growing uh, photosynthetic, photosynthetic organisms in the world only eaten out by bamboo. And there's another one. I take shots of this all the time because when we do a safety stop at 15 feet at the end of the dive, <laughs> there tends to be a lot of that there and it's so photogenic, I can't help myself. Now kelp starts off really looking humble. I kind of showed you the iconic, really pretty shots, but this is what it starts out like, giant kelp. It's this sort of nondescript, kind of wrinkled blade. And um, that's only about, oh, I'd say five to eight centimeters long. And then it starts to undergo a bifurcation. And it splits first initially once, and then it continues to split. And so you can see there's still this sort of ruffled blade, but now it's been separated into two. And as it grows, it continues to separate, and then those air bladders start to form. And those air bladders are lifting the blades up to the surface to get those blades closer to the sunlight, because like I said, these are photosynthetic organisms. And it's really pretty to see these little guys. Oftentimes, we may not necessarily be out there because it's sort of late winter, early spring when you're seeing them at this size. But kelp's beautiful even when it's deformed. Uh, this is uh, a, a growth error. Something happened and it was damaged and it started to spiral on itself. But even when it was growing quote unquote wrong, it's still uh, gorgeous. And then the little cellular structure on, or, or cell-like looking structure on there is a um, bryozoan. The other species that we'll see, the bull kelp, Nereocystis, also has a sort of a nondescript, it looks kind of similar to actually the giant kelp one, the very first one I showed you, but very quickly differentiates itself by having um, a long stipe and then the, the, the formation of that one large single air bladder that actually does not have a composition like air, it actually has a high percentage of carbon monoxide in it. So one of the things kids always ask me, if you ran out of air scuba diving, couldn't you just like put a straw in there and get your knife and breathe air? And I go, well, in theory, that could work with the giant kelp, but it would not be a good idea with the bull kelp. I don't want to die of carbon monoxide poisoning. Um, and as they develop, that, that single pneumatocyst gets larger and larger and larger and it gets thicker and thicker. And some of you, Probably, maybe one person in here, maybe Greg Kaye, has used that as a pumpkin head uh, and carved out. Uh, uh, and sometimes people use them as horns or bugles, and there's all kinds of fun things to do with the bull kelp. Now, I'm going to switch from the kelp to some of the things that live on the rocks that support the kelp. There's lots of colorful organisms. Um, here, one of the, the critters. Um, the nudibranchs, the sea slugs, um, can be extremely colorful. Some of them actually utilize the kelp. So these are lion's mane nudibranchs, melibi. And here they're actually in a mating aggregation. They climb up the giant kelp, or if there's no giant kelp available, whatever is sort of there, and get in these masses where they will reproduce with one another and then start laying egg cases. Now the mystery is, where are they the rest of the time? because I'll, I'll, I'll hopefully show you a little later on um, some footage where it's, it, there's literally thousands of them. And I'm thinking where they're big, they're white, they're really conspicuous looking. Um, where are they the rest of them? Because they're very rare. Other species of slugs will also be up on the kelp. Why, I don't know. This is Triopha. Um, 
it was up there about 25 feet off the bottom and I'm not sure what was going on because it had probably picked the wrong kelp to climb. Some of these nudibranchs will feed on um, hydroids and bryozoans that are growing on the kelp. This case, this was one of these almost dead uh, single strands of giant kelp that basically had nothing on it. So this poor slug had made a poor choice. Um, the hold fast is the, it's not, they're not roots, they're structures that hold fast to the rock and serve as habitat for lots and lots of organisms. So even though this holdfast unfortunately has become detached, and so that kelp is still alive, but it's just drifting at this point, probably gonna get tangled in another kelp, add some excess weight to that one, and cause a chain reaction, rip more out. But in the meantime, there's all kinds of organisms, lots of brittle stars, snails, crustaceans, all living in that holdfast, probably on the order of hundreds, if not a couple thousand individuals of different species in that sort of basketball plus size structure. And then sometimes you see holdfasts that have been overrun by urchins. Um, you probably saw some this photo or some of the other photos that were in recent articles talking about how we have this increase of urchins in certain sites in the Monterey and Carmel uh, area. And this is one of the cases where uh, normally the urchin populations are kept in check by sea otters because sea otters love to feed on urchins. And the urchins basically never venture out of crevices and rely on drift kelp to basically survive. But when there's not a lot of drift kelp, then they will go on the move. And you'll see things like this where you've got bits and pieces and fragments of the haptera, the root-like structures of the holdfast that have been chewed off and, and completely uh, broken away from the rest of it. And eventually that weakens the kelp to the point it's gonna fall off. Urchins can be really pretty though, in and of themselves. They use a variety of habitats. This one's on a red sponge. And here's a red urchin that's in a hydrocoral, um, one of the species that we have here that actually used to occur. And we know this again from those records of people dragging nets in the late 1800s that occurred right off the coast here in Monterey Bay itself, but have not been here at least for about 60 years or so. Not in shallow depths, um, in deeper depths, yes, but uh, that's something that you'll need to go to Carmel Bay and Big Sur to see now, or take an ROV or a sub out and go to deeper waters. These hydrocorals are not true corals. They're related to things like fire corals that you may have heard about in tropical waters. Um, these don't sting, but they're very fragile. They grow very slowly. The orange stuff next to that's not a coral, it's a bryozoan. Um, but we do have actually three different species of true stony corals here in our kelp force. And this is one of them, the brown cup coral. Um, they've got these translucent tentacles that are full of stinging cells that they use to subdue their prey. Here's kind of a close up looking at them. The cup, the calyx of the animal is actually that the stony calcium carbonate structure and all that other stuff is sort of soft tissue. And anemones are basically garbage cans with a ring of tentacles. What goes in goes out the same orifice. Very simple organisms. Here are some other orange cup corals that are growing on top of and through sponges. And blue is a rare sort of color among the invertebrates down uh, in, the, in the water, but the cobalt sponge is one of the more striking examples of an organism that is blue down in the water. And here's another one of the slugs that may or may not be trying to munch on those tentacles. Even though those tentacles are packed full of stinging cells that are used to subdue prey, there are species of nudibranchs that can feed on those tentacles and use those stinging cells for their own defense. They basically ingest them, don't trigger them, and migrate them out towards the ends of those structures there called serrata, and can use them for their own defense and flail other species. Um, pretty amazing process since those cells are physically triggered. Um, they're not, um, it's not like a nervous trigger, it's a manual trigger. Here's another nudibranch, Hermacenda. Um, again, those serrata, those flame orange structures have essentially extensions of their gut. And these guys cruise around the bottom, very brightly displayed, usually not really being um, preyed upon by much and feeding on hydroids and bryozoans and the like. And one of the more striking ones is the Spanish shawl. Um, 
This is one that can flex up and side down and, and move sort of like if you took the skirt of a dress and were kind of twisting it back and forth, they can actually swim. And if they are attacked by something, they'll detach from the substrate, they kind of turn upside down, and then they start flexing back and forth. And then they actually rise up in the water column. The water passively moves them along. At some point, they either tire or stop flexing, and then they drift down. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Other structures are, in this case, the respiratory structures of these organisms. So instead of having lungs like we have, they've got respiratory structures that have a large surface area in order to maximize the exchange of gases. And they become really um, pretty, it's sort of like almost lacy type structures. And it can be retracted very quickly because little fishes and things oftentimes come along to try and snip those um, off. And so that's the one part of a slug that actually moves fast. <laughs> Here's one of those slugs I was ta telling you about that also swims like the Spanish shawl. This is Dendronotus iris. Um, these guys are seen on the fringes of the kelp reefs and they're out um, mating at some time and then feeding on tube anemones I'll show you and then laying egg cases. When disturbed here they start flexing so you can imagine that's the head on the left there and they start kind of twisting back and forth. They are, it's really fascinating to watch. They'll get actually six, seven feet up off the bottom when disturbed. And then at some point they stop and then they do this a free fall. And they just drift down to the bottom very slowly. And usually they're looking for these guys. These are tube anemones. Um, there's elongate tentacles on the outside that are used to capture particles in the water, little plankton, little bits of detritus. They're moved to the inner set of tentacles and then towards this gut and ingested. They're really pretty. Comes in all kinds of colors, purples, blacks, whites, yellows. Um, really interesting. Uh, and here is one of those dendronotids that is just about to plunge. So you can, there's a white sort of mass that's actually extending its sort of mouth, its buccal mass outside of the, the body where it's normally held and is as fast as a slug can, which is not very fast, <laughs> lunging into that tube anemone and trying to actually chew up those tentacles. And the anemone actually retracts in pretty fast. Again, these are slow moving animals, so it's not really like a cheetah and a gazelle, but <laughs> you can sit there and watch it and actually enjoy it. <laughs> <clears throat> There are other predators out on the reef, like octopus. A, a few years ago, we had lots of octopus show up. Um, almost any time there's a structure that we see in a kelp forest, when we see like a bottle or something that's some trash that's been discarded and we go to pick it up, I always tell people, shake it out. There's almost always an octopus in there. And sometimes they, oh, we, one came out and we got it and we'll get up on the boat. And what's on the bottom of the boat? Another couple of octopus that are crawling around. I said, you didn't get them all out. Let's send them back in. Um, so they're very, very bright, um, interesting animals. They'll interact with you. We have other predators out there that are also mollusks. These are chestnut cowries, the only temperate water cowrie. Most people think of cowries as in tropical waters, and that's where most of those animals do occur. But we have one here, um, <clears throat> and they are really pretty, but you don't usually see them because for the most part, they're either crepuscular or nocturnal. And um, that, that tissue that's coming up, the mantle that's covering the shell, is one of the reasons the shell is always so pristine and clean. That doesn't allow organisms to settle on it. <coughs> Excuse me. And then we've got some you know, predators that are you know, real predators that feed on things like those calories, those snails. Uh, the sunflower star, which unfortunately has undergone uh, a massive decline due to sea star wasting syndrome. <clears throat> we used to see those all over, and it's been since December of 2013 since I've seen an adult like that. They're essentially gone. Um, but there are young ones out there, so the species persists, just not in its adult form. And this is, we have a lot of cool things in, in Central California. We have the biggest chitin in terms of the gumboot chitin. We have one of the biggest um, uh, epistobranchs in the sea hare. And this is actually the fastest sea star in the world. 
at a whopping one meter per minute, that's the fastest star out there. That's the Usain Bolt <laughs> for the track world in terms of sea stars, um, one meter per minute. <clears throat> we also have herbivores. Some of them are feeding directly on the kelp. Others are feeding on the detritus. Others are feeding other species. We have lots of really cool colors. And this is the jewel top snail, Caliostoma. That bright purple and gold doesn't fade as the shell um, once the organism is uh, dead. And usually those shells are occupied by hermit crabs. But most of the organisms in the kelp forest are filter feeders. And we have lots and lots of filter feeders. So this big, looks like a tennis ball. This is the gray puffball sponge. Um, it's a filter feeder. You've got corals around it that are filter feeders. There's another white sponge down the corner that's a filter feeder. Um, we have lots of things that are filtering the water. We're in a productive area where we've got upwelling going on. We've got lots of plankton. We also have the kelp forest itself providing organic material to this food web because as the kelp dies and is broken up into smaller and smaller pieces, it becomes available for things like these filter feeders. And this poor orange puffball sponge is not going to be orange for long. It's being covered by a gray tuna kit. <clears throat> so space is a premium. Even if you think you've got space and you're able to hold it off, someone might come along and grow over you. Here's a light bulb tuna kit. This is another filter feeder. Water goes in one tube, goes through a, basically a basket, and comes out the other tube. And these are urochordates. They're actually in the same phylum as we are, the chordata. So they're related to the fishes and the amphibians and the birds and the fishes and mammals, etc. So even though they don't really look like it, at a very early larval stage, you couldn't tell that from a human. They would be virtually identical. And then we've got filter feeders who generate very elaborate structures to increase their surface area. So we talked about surface area being important for gas exchange. It's also important if you are feeding. And so here's a sea cucumber that has 10 tentacles with very extensive branching. And periodically it takes one of those, puts it in its mouth, wipes everything off, sticks it back out, and waits for more stuff to passively get stuck on all that branching. Here's another cucumber. So that was a filter feeding cucumber. This is a deposit feeding cucumber. Uh, not quite as sexy, but uh, it dabs the surface and it performs a function much like these bat stars, kind of feeding on the detrital food. And then we've got, finally, we're moving into some of the fishes. And here's uh, a, a fish that's sticking itself out of a cluster of invertebrates, hydroids, tunicates. Um, some of these fish are hiding, and they're very cryptic, but once they come out of their hidey hole, they may have extremely colorful bodies, and it's rare to see some of these uh, fringe heads and war bonnets and like out of their crevices, out of their holes. So when we do see them out, it's always a rush to try and get an image of them. Some of them just hide underneath underhangs, even though they've got bright red lipstick and black and yellow stripes. <laughs> Um, they're shy kind of by nature. This is a tree fish that uh, was eventually coaxed to come out here. And others hide in plain sight. So here is a uh, cotted that's sitting there and blends right in and actually is in transparent. You can see through parts of the dorsal fin, part of the, the pectoral fins, um, they're actually transparent. And these organisms blend in very well to their habitat. Um, it looks like there's actually coralline crust growing on right behind the head of this sculpin, but it's actually just the pigmentation of the fish. So amazing camouflage. Um, here's a cabazon uh, that's surrounded by sponges, tunicates, bryozoans, annelids, and um, they are variable in color as well. They can be brown or green or blue. Um, reddish in color, depends on their habitat. And then sometimes we have fish that just don't necessarily care a whole heck of a lot if they're being seen or not. They just raise their spines and say, don't mess with me. Here's a gopher rockfish um, that's kind of giving me the look as I got in closer and closer trying to get that shot. And sometimes color in fishes is indicative of whether you're a male or a female. 
So oftentimes we don't have sexual dimorphism in these organisms, but this is one of the species we do. So we have a male kelp greenling here who's got these really iridescent bright blue patches on the head versus the female, which has a light kind of gray background and lots of orange kind of speckled spots on her body. And then sometimes color changes as you grow, just like us. We may start with brown hair or blonde hair and eventually gets to be gray hair or no hair. And <laughs> we've got fish here that look like they don't have a, a, a caudal fin, but it's just transparent at the end there. It's red and it's got some yellow. And then as it becomes a teenager, it becomes a little bit more red. You can see the color is now extending further out on that caudal fin, the back end there. But there's still a clear strip on it until you become an adult and you've hopefully not a teen anymore because this one's pregnant. Um, <laughs> This is one of the vermilion rockfish. So when you think of vermilion, you go, yes, bright red. But those other two I showed you earlier were vermilions just as youngsters. So here's a gravid uh, individual, and it's about to pop out some of those little guys we saw earlier. And sometimes the fish just has a lot of attitude because it's got a mouth full of teeth, and it dares you to get close. And here's a ling cod. And ling cod are great because they do let you get close. They let you get so close sometimes you can see the parasites on their head. Um, and they definitely have attitude. As do sometimes the rockfish. This is my, my mobster shot of, hey, what are you looking at, huh? <laughs> you know, this, they, they, even though oftentimes fish are headed away from you, some are attracted by bubbles, some are attracted by what you're doing, and they'll come right up to you and give you a flash. We also have um, things like mammals. I couldn't, even though I'm not really a fur and feather kind of a guy, I knew folks would want this. <laughs> so I appreciate everyone having stuck through all of the invertebrates. But um, we do get visitations by harbor seals that are, are almost always benign. Um, I'm still scared of sea lions. Um, they move so fast and are so big and can get so close to you. It's not that I'm worried they're actually going to do something to me. It's, it's very rare that they, they bite a scuba diver. It's just at those moments I realize this is an 800,000 pound animal that's moving 10, 15 knots underwater. And that's what sharks can capture and eat. I'm just a floating sandwich. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm maybe not even a sandwich. I might be like one of those little cucumber appetizer sandwiches, but I'm just sitting there. So that's really what scares me when I see these animals very fluidly moving through the water, cutting through it like it's nothing, and then I'm just kind of bobbing along. Uh, it, it puts everything in perspective. And then sometimes they'll be really curious. They oftentimes are biting our tapes that we're using to measure things and um, to collect data. And here's poor Chad, uh, who's being investigated by the um, harbor seal. And then um, I just want to show this shot. Um, so here's Chad, who provided a lot of these photos um, with one of those sunflower stars. And you know the sunflower stars, like I said, are massive, they're very fast, they're important predators in the system. And that size of a star, the last time I saw one was in December of 2013. And I've seen small ones that probably fit on the top of my thumb, and some that are now about the size of a quarter. But we don't know how long it's going to take for those little guys, if they survive, to get to that size, extra large pizza. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to uh, show you a couple of clips of, let's see if I do this right. One, two, three, boom. And then it's all bubbles for a second. That's us diving into the water. Here's sort of what it looks like when you get underwater. There's, in this case, there were a lot of rockfishes. Most of these are blue rockfishes. There's some olive yellowtails that Bob here in the, in the audience can tell us if they're olives or yellowtails. 
um, and then there's some kelp rockfish, but you can get a sense of the kelp itself as a forest and just the, the numerous fishes and then the rocks, you can't really tell what's on there. You have to get up close and usually with a flashlight to really uh, experience the color. But this is sort of like if you're in the woods cruising around, you just happen to be floating. <laughs> And in this case, it was the woods on a windy day. So everything was moving. Um, sometimes we see really cool things. This is in Big Sur. We call this, or I call it the fairy arch. It doesn't actually have a real name. But we found this because as you dive underneath it, it's just packed full of invertebrates. It's a really cool um, spot. We stumbled across it while we were doing surveys um, inside and outside of marine protected areas. And what, we, what I saw is after we dove through there, the arch itself is porous. And when we got onto the top of the arch, which actually has kelp growing on it, there's little bubbles kind of coming out. And it, it just seemed like one of these crazy little enchanted forests. But um, there are still things to be discovered and explored down in Big Sur. We're very fortunate that we get to um, do work down there. And that's one of the cool places. And then I'm going to show you uh, this is um, me with a GoPro on my head trying to get one of those shots. I was done collecting my data and my, my dive buddy was still working on the tape so I was kind of killing some time while they finished and then I felt some tugging on my fin and so I said all right well I'm gonna flop down here so I'm not standing up anymore and and see if this harbor seal wants to keep and I don't know why they have this fascination with fins they love they chew on our tape and they chew on our fins not biting hard but just kind of almost like they're teething and now watch suddenly the guy goes ooh Who's that? And then took off. When I see a harbor seal take off, when it looked at something, I get scared. <laughs> and, and then I saw, oh, what was that? And so did you guys see what that was? Uh, it, it was, it was and, I'm, and I'll, show you, I'll show you here in a second um, because I was visited again by this particular individual. So I'm minding my own business. And I'll skip ahead here on this one. I'm minding my own business trying to get some footage of a uh, young of the year uh, perch. And so we've got some uh, striped perch and uh, black perch that are in amongst this kelp here. And so I'm just minding my own business, trying to get some footage of these guys kind of swimming around um, because we just haven't had really good recruitments. And then I feel this bump on my shoulder and I swivel my head and look who's there. <laughs> it's like, woo. So this little otter, and I've, I've actually happened to, happened to me multiple times. I've actually had been taking pictures and had an otter come and grab the camera. <laughs> like, what, what is this thing? And, and then, because usually I'm relatively motionless. I'm kind of just sitting there trying to get a shot. And then I kind of move and the otter's like, whoa, what was that thing? And <laughs> takes off. But this is the one time I actually had the camera rolling when I got uh, accosted by one of these otters. Um, which was pretty pretty exciting and and then uh, I just want to show this um, this is you know the mosquitoes in Minnesota so to speak I, it's it's this is the year I, I call it in, in my notes and things the year of the rock of the year of the yoy these young of the year rockfish and they were just everywhere and so here's Chad swimming through the kelp uh, kind of getting some footage of the kelp and here I am per usual face a few inches from the rock just as I started my career I continue to be looking at things just a few inches away from my face um, but it's pretty spectacular um, diving in these kelp forests so that's the end of the videos and then I just wanted to finish very quickly and then we'll have time to take some questions a lot of the stuff you've been seeing, um, a lot of the images, almost all of the species, um, we've been, uh, Chad has been leading the effort uh, at the sanctuary office to create a free 
um, uh, iPhone, iPad, and iPod Touch app that um, has a lot of species, over 550 species, pictures for each one, and for uh, over 100 of them, natural history information. So it covers birds, mammals, algae, fishes, invertebrates, um, and if you have a phone or an iPad or your friends do, it's free. You can just download it and then you can learn about what's the difference between a, a Brant's cormorant and a double-crested cormorant. You know, they all look like blackbirds to me. How do I tell the difference? Or if you want to know the difference between a strawberry anemone and a white spotted anemone, you can look that up. And then the other thing that we have as a resource for folks that we're very proud of is our, our website that has not only all the scientific uh, sort of information, the metadata about who's doing what, when, and where, and why, but we also have an online um, field guide, a species database, so you don't have to buy 10 different field guides to get information on the really common species that you're likely to see, tide pooling or diving or just walking on the beach. Um, and we also have all, uh, over 5,000 images, and there are many of the images you've seen tonight are in that, and they're in the public domain because they were taken while we were on the dime for the government. So they're there for folks to use. And we have lots of school children using them in book reports and they show up in publications and things all over the place, things we never even anticipated. So with that, <laughs> diving <laughs> truly is uh, a dream in these kelp forests. And for me, the dream continues. And I'm very fortunate to have this job and I thank you for the opportunity to speak to you.